Merkel and Obama are meeting for the last time. At some point, his successor, Donald Trump, will surely also be a guest here, ushering in a new chapter in German-American relations. All right, well, we're waiting for Obama and Merkel to walk out any moment now to the stage. But in the meantime, I want to continue our conversation with Dave Keating. Dave, um, President Obama, final two months. Um, should Chancellor Merkel, like uh, Prime Minister, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, reach out to uh, Donald Trump, the president-elect, build a relationship with him in, in, instead of, uh, uh, of uh, continuing kind of uh, her, uh, her love affair with, uh, with uh, Obama? It's a tough call. Every leader has had to make this decision. Theresa May in the UK has clearly chosen uh, the Japanese route to uh, make overtures to the incoming US president. Um, Japan has also, uh, Japan and Germany have similar histories with the United States over the past 70 years and obviously a little bit earlier than that. Uh, so far, it seems that Merkel is choosing the harder of the two options. Um, now, this was, Obama's European visit was pre-planned before the Trump um, victory, but she could have shortened it. She could have tried to downplay the expectations around it. She chose not to. She could have had a more conciliatory uh, welcome uh, statement to Trump's victory. She chose not to. So all indications so far are that uh, these discussions between Obama and Merkel are going to continue intensively over the next two months, and that she is coming to at least uh, accept the hype around her at the moment, that she is the last remaining defender of liberal Western democracy. And as a matter of fact, I think they, they had an op-ed uh, that was uh, uh, published on Thursday in Germany's uh, weekly business magazine Wirtschaftswoche, uh, where both leaders stressed under, that, that the underlying bedrock of their shared values is strong. Are they trying to convince themselves? Uh, what's going on here? Well, it's interesting because in that op-ed, they tried to talk about the relates to, to focus on the relationship between America and Germany, not not the relationship between Barack Obama and Merkel, as in this relationship continues. Nobody reading that op-ed believes that. Um, the relationship between America and Germany is, is going to be fundamentally different. Um, but what they were trying to do in that op-ed is defend the existing world order. They talked a lot about world trade. Uh, they said they both still want TTIP, that's the US-EU free trade agreement to happen. That's obviously not going to happen now. Um, but they, it was, it was a, a robust defense of the way that the Western world has organized itself for the past 70 years. Um, we'll see if that defense is something that resonates with people, but it does seem that a significant number of people in the Western world are not happy with the current global order and want want a very dramatic change. In terms of, because trade, of course, is uh, going to be one of his uh, flagship uh, policies. Is that one of the ways that they're trying to constrict the changes that he wants to implement? Um, it, it's very, it'll be very difficult to restrict him on that stage. I mean, um, trade is something that's very much in the purview of the US president, as are all foreign policy issues. Um, so it's, it's hard to, you know, in Obama's statements on Monday, he seemed to be suggesting that the best thing for Donald Trump to do, if in particular he, he isn't very interested in actual governing, which kind of his, his body language and facial expressions have, have suggested so far, that the best thing for him to do is to delegate this type of stuff to competent people. I'm sure that is what Angela Merkel is hoping for, and that's the direction that they're trying to push the new US president in. As far as I'm aware, uh, Merkel has not had any kind of extensive conversation with Trump. I believe they spoke very briefly over the phone the next day, but there certainly haven't been uh, anything in the way of extensive contacts between the incoming Trump Team and that's and not herself. really strange. I mean, you know, it's kind of not done. You wait until he's taken the oath of office before you reach out. Yes, that's true. Although some leaders took it upon themselves. The the um, leader of Egypt's military junta was the first one to contact Trump, I guess, because he was able to find the phone number of somebody who worked at a Trump golf course who there passed it go. on down. There you go. How much of a wake-up call is uh, the victory of Donald Trump for European leaders? It's, it's a huge wake-up call. It, it has to be a huge wake-up call. And it only crystallizes something that they've known for a long time but have not wanted to accept, that the era of 
American military protection over Europe is coming to an end, and it was coming to an end whether Donald Trump was elected or not. Uh, it does not make sense right now with all of Europe's wealth and its capability uh, and its potential to still be living under an American military protectorate. So this, possibly the, the leaders may have recognized this, the European public certainly didn't. And perhaps this election, which nobody in Europe would have not noticed, will change the European public's thinking about what things need to change. Now, the big question is, how do they think things should change? So somehow Europe has to react to what's happened. Does it react by going to a more federal structure in terms of the European Union, by banding together, by pooling military resources, by pooling economic resources? What's the likelihood of that? Well, With I don't know, UK because now yeah, we see out. so far Europe has been going in the opposite direction. Uh, Euroscepticism is on the rise. Far-right movements are on the rise. The Brexit votes, it was a narrow win. I mean, 52%. So that means 48% of voters in the UK uh, don't, want the, want, don't want Europe to go in that direction. So these are movements that are rising, but certainly they don't reflect, I don't even think they reflect the majority of opinion, they're just the loudest at the moment. So the loudest and most powerful movements at the moment are against that European integration. They're pro-nationalism, they want to go back to the purely nation-state model of Europe. Um, they have been the loudest, but perhaps this election wakes people on the other side up that they need to be more vocal because the other side is winning right now. Mm -hmm. So they need to be more vocal. I'm just wondering in terms of, um, you know, President Obama being more or less a lame duck. I mean, of course, he, he still has a couple of months uh, in office still. Is this trip also a way for him to ensure his legacy? Um, what's the purpose of this trip, basically? I think he's, he's obviously got to be very worried about his legacy right now because this seems like a rejection of everything he's done. And because he did so much through executive order rather than through legislative means, Donald Trump can basically undo almost everything he's done as president. So he at least wants to go out with an image that, you know, he held things together and that he steered the world toward maintaining the liberal democratic global order. And that even out of office, we don't know actually what, what he's going to do when out of office. He could, I mean, he's, he enjoys such remarkable public approval ratings. When you think about George W. Bush in 2008, when he lost, he was down to something, I think like 20 or 30% approval. George W. Bush basically disappeared after he uh, left the White House, after Barack Obama entered. I don't think Barack Obama is going to disappear. One, because um, his approval ratings are so high, he carries a powerful voice still. And also because he's worried about his legacy and he's going to do everything he can to make sure that that the work that he's done over the past eight years is disrupted to the least extent possible. So a salvage what he built. Okay, well, we'll see how successful he'll be at that. Dave, please stand by, because we're still waiting for that press uh, conference to uh, get underway, and we'll carry it live, and uh, we'd like to get your reaction to it as well. But for now... Even if the heady mood of eight years ago has faded, Germans will remember Barack Obama as a man who filled them with hopes, but then couldn't fulfil many of them. All right, uh, where we'll continue our special live coverage uh, of President Barack Obama's visit to Berlin. We're waiting for him to come out uh, along with Chancellor Angela Merkel momentarily. We'll be carrying that live for you. But in the meantime, um, I want to bring in Dave uh, again to continue our conversation. Eight years ago, who can forget the crowd? Such uh, inspirational time. I mean, he was a senator at the time. Merkel did not receive him, but nonetheless, I mean, the crowds were loving it. Yeah, it was a huge moment, and it was a, a huge moment of hope for Germans because U.S.-German uh, relations had gone so sour during the George W. Bush administration, mainly because of the Iraq War. That was a war that Germany opposed. It obviously went ahead. Um, Germans, uh, if you were an American living in Germany during those years, you were not so popular. Uh, and that changed really, really fast after 2008. Um, Germans... Their attitude toward America really, I mean, as we just saw in that piece, just took a, a fundamental shift. Um, and that, but that was damaged when the revelations about the wiretapping came out. Um, it was something that Germans themselves were concerned about. And then when it, when it emerged that even their chancellor had had her phone bugged, uh, was, 
was very alarming. How to much a lot of, of an issue here. was that? I mean, illustrate that for us. I mean, that was a big deal here in Germany when uh, those NSA revelations came out and uh, it became known that the NSA was eavesdropping on Merkel. Yeah, there are no Europeans more concerned about privacy than Germans. It is a subject here that is really an obsession. And part of that is, of course, the history of East Germany uh, during the Cold War, of course, the Nazi period before that. People have a, a real guttural reaction to the idea that the government is watching you or that businesses are watching you or or anyone else. And so when they learned that about the US, it, I think it felt to a lot of people like a friend had betrayed you, um, particularly since these revelations came out during the Obama presidency. I think the one silver lining, the one hope that Germans could cling to was that, well, even if the US is spying, it's Barack Obama, we like him. So funnily enough, they were reassured by that, yes. by him being in power. And I think uh, certainly what I've heard from a lot of Germans the past week is they are instantly going to this, um, the data surveillance thing. There was um, Oliver Stone's movie, uh, Snowden, Snowden the movie, which was majority funded by, um, I believe, the German state, actually. Um, but it was a, a, a biopic, a biopic of um, Edward Snowden, who released the, the NSA uh, spying documents. And at the end of that movie, there's a line where Edward Snowden says, you may not be concerned about the US government having all of this information about you right now because you trust the government, but what about who comes in next? And right now, nobody knows what kind of administration we're, we're dealing with next. And I've heard that quoted from Germans the past week over and over, the last line of that movie. So the feeling about this is very intense here. Very intense. Uh, people not reassured uh, just of yet. Now, uh, as we mentioned earlier on, Obama, of course, a staunch uh, a supporter of uh, the chancellor. Interestingly, he did not have to, but he did. He came out and publicly defended her uh, not so long ago, saying that she did the right thing when it came to her refugee uh, policy. I mean, she faced massive backlash uh, here in Germany. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, those comments from Obama came after Trump had said that uh, she was basically destroying Germany by allowing these refugees to come in. Um, you know, you don't know how these things work behind the scenes. Maybe she asked him to, say, put in a good word for her. Uh, you know, certainly we saw in the, in the Brexit debate, Cameron asked Obama to put in a good word for him in the Brexit case. This is something that, that is diplomatically possible when you have a leader who is so popular abroad. Um, I'm sure it's something that she appreciated. It's a message that Germans would have listened to. They do listen when President Obama speaks. Um, so I think it, it probably had some effect in calming the political situation here. The, the, the comments came at a time when even some in Merkel's own party, I mean, the knives were sharpening. She's in her third term. Uh, at that point, it was not clear whether she is going to run for a fourth. Um, there are all kinds of people waiting in the wings in her party who would like to replace her, and they saw this as an opening. But I think Maybe this is attributing too much import to what he said, but I think that his comments did have an effect in at least squelching any kind of party rebellion within Merkel's Christian Democrats. Do you think that his visit now will have an impact on her maybe running for a fourth term? Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, my suspicion is that she herself was unsure or ambivalent about this fourth term. Again, from my conversations the past week, from people on all sides of the German political spectrum, left and right, they say that Merkel has to run. She is Western liberal democracy's last hope. If she doesn't run, there's no logical successor for her here in Germany. The, the rival center-left party uh, is in a shambles. They, have, they don't even know who they're going to field to challenge her. Um, so there is, there's no, un, unless somebody, you know, emerges from a, a bunker somewhere that she's been storing, there's no successor to her within the CDU. There's no logical successor. So if she doesn't run, the German political system is in chaos. And that's exactly the kind of environment in which a candidate from the German far right party, the alternative for Germany, AFD, that's exactly the kind of situation where somebody could come from out of there. The AFD is a really new party. Their main face right now at the moment is Frau Petri, um, who interestingly has a kind of a similar background uh, from Merkel. But she is nowhere near the, the place where she would need to be to mount a challenge to Merkel. Uh, she's no Trump, in other words. She's no Trump. But if Merkel wasn't on the ballot, who knows who her challenger would be? And then it maybe suddenly becomes possible. So I think the attitude in Germany right now is, whether you like it or not, you got to vote for her.
All right. Well, we're going to continue our conversation again because the, the uh, press conference has not kicked off just yet. But uh, one of the key issues during uh, President Obama's visit to Europe is the future of NATO. Well, following Donald Trump's election victory well, during the campaign, uh, President-elect Trump suggested he may weaken the U.S.'s commitment to the Western military alliance. Well, in this week's edition of uh, Conflict Zone, DW's uh, Tim Sebastian has been talking to retired U.S. General David Petraeus, and he asked him what he thinks about Trump's position on NATO. Given that... Trump called it obsolete. Are you worried that NATO is not going to survive Trump's presidency? I'm not worried about that. What I am worried about is that the cooperation and the working together that has characterized this alliance, which is so important now, given various threats around the world, uh, that that could be eroded. Now, let me say, by the way, once again, he has been on to something that is legitimate. Uh, Secretary Gates, in his final session with the North Atlantic Council, I was there as the commander of the uh, forces in Afghanistan, said to all of them, you are not paying your fair share. Uh, you're not meeting the 2% of uh, GDP threshold in your defense spending. Now, that has improved a bit in recent years because of some of the threats that are emerging in various places. But this coalition matters. It's a cornerstone of American security policy. It's a cornerstone of the Western uh, world's security policy. So again, I'm hopeful that the element of his comments that is correct, that others need to do more, that they need to bear more of the burden, uh, that they will step up to that. And indeed, we can, we can forge a continued cooperative effort as we go forward. All right, uh, retired U.S. General David Petraeus there talking to DW's Tim Sebastian. And you can watch the interview in full, as always, on our website. Just go to DW.com Conflict Zone. All right, I want to continue my conversation with Dave because it's been very enlightening. We're still waiting for the press conference to kick off and we'll take you there live as uh, it hopefully takes uh, gets underway momentarily. But in the meantime, Dave, we just heard there from uh, uh, General Petraeus that NATO is the cornerstone of uh, Western security, uh, basically. Uh, is Germany worried that they might have to step up now if Trump uh, 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 does what he promised and pulls out a little bit more from NATO in terms of funding? Yeah, interestingly, there have been ideas for the European Union to take on a military capacity for years, um, just through military cooperation, not an EU army, as some might say, but just the armies of the European Union being coordinated in a way in which they can act together, like NATO, except without relying on the United States as the, as the cornerstone. Um, in September, sensing the possibility of a Trump victory, I think, uh, Merkel, along with the leaders of France and Italy, put forward a proposal for, for the first time, an EU capacity over military matters, a cooperation between uh, the militaries of Europe. The UK says they will veto this. For years, they've always said they will not tolerate any kind of military capacity for the EU because it undermines NATO and it undermines the United States. Um, France has long been distrustful of NATO, going back to its very beginning. They didn't join, or they joined and then left in the 1960s. Um, so France is very keen on the idea. Um, this, this idea now has gone into hyperdrive. Uh, Federica Mogherini, who is the EU's foreign policy chief, uh, convened a summit, an emergency summit of EU foreign, uh, foreign ministers this week in Brussels to try to get this, this proposal that was put on the table in September moving very fast. The problem is the UK may or may not be on the way out of the EU, but either way, they say they will veto any attempt to create European military self-reliance so over leave the next Europe? two years. I mean, this, this infuriates European leaders because the UK, the current government, wants to leave. They say they're going to leave, but they say we're going to handicap you on our way out. We're going to knock you in the knee because we think the United States will always be there. We may be looking at a world where there is some kind of alliance between the Brexit government in the UK and the Trump government in the US. And I think a lot of people here in continental Europe view that potential alliance as being hostile to continental Europe, or at least ambivalent. So this is, this is really going to come to a head, I think, in the next two months, that um, the, the EU leaders are going to say to the UK, look, you're leaving. 
you need to stop with the veto threats or we will find some way around you. The EU does have this mechanism actually uh, insisted on by the UK several years ago in which only some, uh, I forget the word for this, but it's some, only some EU states can move forward with a particular type of cooperation. It exists right now for the European patents right now because Italy and Spain didn't want to participate. Um, they may go forward in that way. Um, I think that any amount of reassurance that Obama is about to give during his press conference about NATO is really going to sound hollow to people here. They were already nervous about the durability of this military alliance. Trump, whatever he's said in the past week, it's very clear that he, at the very least, doesn't care about NATO. And he may have people around him who do care. He may have generals who do care. But it's, it would, it's hard to be European right now and have confidence in this military relationship. Well, on that point, for the purpose of this discussion, let's imagine for a moment that this European initiative does take off, that, that the UK does not veto it. Is it enough to fill the void that a possible US retreat uh, could, uh, could leave? No, it's, it's too little too late, essentially. Germany has basically no military to speak of. It would take two decades to build up a military capacity that is equivalent even to France. The two, really, the, two, the only two European countries that have um, you know, real capable militaries that are capable of doing more than just defending their immediate territory uh, are France and the UK. The UK is ostensibly leaving the EU, that leaves France. Um, the, the other, I, I put in that caveat because the other state is Greece, but Greece's military is huge, but mainly designed to defend themselves from Turkey. Um, so a, the idea of the EU military cooperation is in an ideal world where the UK stays in Europe is that the military capability of France and the UK together can be used to defend the whole continent while at the same time the other member states increase their military spending because of course they've been slacking off on this for decades because the idea has always been that the United States will come in and save the day. And so you don't really, you can spend that money on other things. You can spend that money, Germany can spend that money um, building a very nice social welfare system uh, rather than having it go into the military because the US will always be there. The US is suddenly not there. And Germany is starting from a very low point. And it's interesting when people are talking about Merkel as the next leader of the free world or the last defender of liberal democracy. How do you have a leader of the free world who has no military, who controls no, I mean, you know, Germany does nominally have a military, but it's incapable of doing basically anything. Um, it's, it's not gonna give people a lot of confidence if it's they- soft power, Dave. It's, it's soft power, yeah. And, and, you know, in today's world, that may be enough. I mean, you know, maybe some of these ideas about um, military superiority are very outdated now. Um, we're about to find out, I think. We're about to find out. Let's stick with the uh, security theme for a moment, if you like, uh, because, of course, Russia is looming large when it comes to foreign policy, especially here in Germany. Uh, of course, with Obama and the Obama administration, uh, Germany and Europe in general were singing from the same song sheet when it comes to uh, Russia. Now, of course, with President Donald, uh, uh, President-elect, I should say, uh, Donald Trump uh, g coming into office and, and saying, you know, he wants good relations with uh, Donald Trump. How worrying is that when it comes to vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Moscow and Berlin and you know, all the, the people that are opposed to what Russia has done in the past couple of years uh, concerning Crimea, concerning Georgia? Yeah, it's, it's very worrying because the response um, to Russia's action has been this type of soft power as in sanctions. Um, those sanctions have worked. They've hurt Russia, but they've worked possibly just because they came at the same time as an energy price collapse. Um, and also they came at the same time as Russia was imposing um, uh, sanctions on Western goods as well. So those sanctions have had an effect. If the US suddenly pulls out, they will be a lot less effective and it's unclear whether Europe would continue those sanctions if the US, if Trump decided to pull out of them. Um, and without the sanctions, then there's concern that Putin moves very quickly in uh, Eastern Ukraine and in Syria. Uh, and then there's really nothing the Europeans can do to, uh, to stop him. So it's choosing between a rock and a hard place. Uh, all right. Well, uh, the uh, press conference between uh, President Barack Obama and uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel is still, uh, we're still waiting for that to uh, uh, take place. Uh, in the meantime, uh, 
Let's talk about Hillary Clinton, because she made her first public appearance since she conceded defeat to Donald Trump last week, while she is still recovering from the crushing disappointment of her electoral loss. But when she spoke at a charity event for children, she gave young Americans a message of hope. The former presidential candidate looked wary as she took to the stage. A harrowing election campaign season had clearly taken its toll. It was an emotional address in which Clinton spoke of how challenging the last few days had been for her. Oh, thank you. Now, I will admit, coming here tonight wasn't the easiest thing for me. There have been a few times this past week when uh, all I wanted to do was just to curl up with a good book or our dogs and never leave the house again. Despite the disappointment of losing the presidential campaign, Clinton came out fiercely in favour of hope. She urged Americans to stay engaged on every level and never give up. America is still the greatest country in the world. This is still the place where anyone can beat the odds. It's up to each and every one of us to keep working to make America better and stronger and fairer. Thank you. God bless you and God bless the work of the Children's Defense Fund. Hillary Clinton there uh, speaking. Uh, Dave, there's no point in relitigating what has happened and rehashing how things uh, went down, but uh, explain to us uh, I mean, the European leaders were basically banking on Hillary Clinton becoming the next president of the United States. Um, how are they recalibrating themselves now that they're having to deal with a new reality? I mean, an uncertain reality. I think that in a way, Hillary Clinton would have provided them a useful fiction that everything's fine and that the current world order is not you know, threatened like in no time in the last 70 years. Yes, she would have maintained everything as it was, essentially continued the Obama policy, but those people who voted for Trump would still be there. Um, the people who voted for Brexit will still be there. The people who may, are maybe about to vote for Marine Le Pen in France may still be there. Um, and so, you know, we would have just ticked away. We probably wouldn't be talking about the US election this week if Hillary Clinton had won last Tuesday. Um, but of course, that force is still there. Um, so. You, you wouldn't have seen kind of crisis meetings this week. You wouldn't have seen, um, you know, at, the, at this uh, meeting between Obama and Merkel today, it would have been just a high-fiving, everything's great, I'm so happy uh, kind of event. Um, I'm sure that Obama would have tried to prop up Merkel and try to help European leaders with their, their upcoming elections. But uh, it, it might have not been very attuned to the reality of the world we're living in. And uh, Dave, explain to us for the non-initiated in terms of transition. Uh, it would have been, of course, uh, an easier transition if Hillary Clinton had been uh, elected in terms of foreign policy. That now, there's a distinct break, uh, of course, between uh, the uh, Obama administration's foreign policy and uh, Donald Trump. How difficult is that transition? Uh, can you explain to that? Uh, us, uh, What's interesting, in 2008, when Obama was elected, in November 2008, the transition went notoriously terribly, mainly because there was an ongoing economic crisis. Lehman Brothers had just collapsed in September. So the, the transition was a total mess and people were really scared because that economic crisis was happening at the same time as a rather uncomfortable transition. I mean, don't forget Barack Obama, he didn't say anything quite as horrible during the campaign about George w, George w. Bush as Trump has said about Obama, but still wasn't very nice. Um, so that was an awkward transition as well. Obama, because of the bad experience with that transition, put in a law in 2010 saying that the campaigns of both the major parties would have months of cooperation. This was for the first time in US history. Uh, both campaigns had offices just across from the White House. They were supposed to be coordinating, they were coordinating, but the main coordination was between the Obama administration and the Clinton administration. Chris Christie, former New Jersey governor, who may be about to be indicted for a scandal in New Jersey, still unclear, was running that transition team. It now looks like he was put in that office because they thought it was, the Trump campaign thought that was not a necessary office because they didn't 
think they would win because last week they fired him. And so the whole transition team is now in complete disarray. We've seen resignation after resignation, constant swapping of people. The law in 2010 was supposed to avoid this kind of thing. But of course, if that transition team didn't use any of the access or facilities that they were given over the past months, then you know the law can only go so far in guaranteeing a smooth transition. And it's, of course, not like many countries here in Europe where you just have a couple of weeks and you have to transition, but also you've got a civil servant kind of system in place that continues with you. Yeah. It's different in the U.S. Totally different. Uh, as you say, it's a longer transition period. It's about three months. Uh, in Europe, lot. this would be uh, like two weeks or something. Um, and that's because the entire White House staff has to be replaced, something that reportedly the Trump campaign didn't realize when they came in. They thought they could keep all of the existing White staff on, White House staff on, and the White House said, well, you can if you want, but they're all Democrats. Um, you know, that the tradition for decades has been you, you clean out the house. I assume that's what they'll do, but they have nobody ready for those positions. And we are uh, two months away from the inauguration. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very involved process in the United States and very different than in Europe. Very different than in Europe. Now, let's talk about Secretary of State. That's, uh, for us, one of the most important uh, positions in the uh, U.S., uh, in the president's administration. We had, of course, Hillary Clinton, uh, who everybody knows here very well in Europe. A lot of names are being rumored now in the U.S., uh, Rudy Giuliani, and maybe potentially since this afternoon, uh, Nikki Haley. Can can you tell us a little bit about these two for an international audience which might not be as familiar with these uh, two politicians? So Giuliani is clearly the more provocative choice. This is the former mayor of New York City. He was a controversial but you could say a successful mayor in New York City. He was mayor at the time of 9-11, of the 9-11 attacks, and uh, for a while he was being called America's mayor. He was out of office shortly after that because his term was due to expire anyway. And since then, he's become a bit of an erratic figure. Uh, he's also done a lot of, um, he's, he's been involved with a lot of companies and, and international countries. He started a consultancy that's done a lot of uh, work that some view as kind of shady. Uh, and during the campaign, he was one of Trump's most outspoken uh, surrogates. He spoke at the Republican National Convention, but that speech was viewed as a little unhinged by a lot of people. He was shouting, he was waving his hands erratically, I mean, really screaming, not just shouting. But he was the first one to come out definitively supporting Trump. He was the only one who would go on the Sunday shows after the leaked audio tape of Trump describing sexual assaults on that bus. He was, everyone else canceled, all of his other surrogates. Rudy Giuliani had to go on basically every Sunday show and defend him. So would him. this be his reward? Well, Trump owes him. What we're seeing so far is the names that are being circulated for this cabinet seem to be purely about loyalty. Anyone who was loyalty, loyal to him during that campaign, which was a kind of dwindling group of people by the end, they seem to be in the running. Now, Nikki Haley was notably not. Um, she was not a Trump supporter. Uh, she did not come out for him. I don't think she ever said that she wouldn't vote for him, but she uh, was not a fan. Um, so she is viewed as a moderate voice in the Republican Party. Um, and I think it would be viewed as some... Uh, um, for Trump, it would be a bit of a climb down to appoint her because she didn't support him. It would be a very reassuring sign, I think, both domestically and abroad, if he were to appoint her. Because it says at the end of the day, he recognizes that his impulse may be to put Giuliani in there for loyalty reasons, but that may not be the best thing for the country or for the world because he does appear to be kind of an unstable person. All right, so it's not necessarily the best man or woman for the job, but more who is going to be loyal to me. We'll All right. see. We'll see, we'll see. All right, stick around. Um, we're still waiting for that press conference uh, to get underway. Well, uh, as Dave uh, was uh, telling us at the start of the show, some observers are describing Barack Obama's visit here as a passing of the torch to German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who's now being seen as the new standard bearer of liberal democracy. Well, in a recent interview, Obama called Merkel his closest international partner. But that partnership, lasting more than eight eventful years, hasn't always been smooth sailing, as we hear in our next report by Michaela Kufner. 